counts. All right. We don't hey. get that everywhere. No. Two for the price of one. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm Patrick Milliken, and uh, hello to everybody on Facebook as well. And uh, we're here with another great double double bill. Uh, my immediate left, we have Robert Knott here, who is uh, here to talk about the, the sixth in the, the new Cole and Hitch novel. And then we have Dana Haynes here to talk about his uh, terrific new thriller, St. Nicholas, Salvage and Wrecking. It's funny, when I was kind of preparing for this, I was trying to come up with a through line, because often you can. Mm -hmm. There is no through line, <laughs> um, which is going to be interesting between your two books. Uh, you mean some sort of uh, comparison? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, okay. Thematic. Well, uh, no, well, again, uh, although we do we do have uh, you know, crime fighting partners, I, I suppose, but that's a that's kind of a thin stretch. Um, it's it's bumpkins. We got nothing. Bumpkins. That's right. Uh, but we'll just kind of. I usually like just to keep it informal and do a chat and then open it up for questions from you guys if you have any. Um, Let's start with Bob. Uh, do you go by Bob? Uh, not not normally, no. I think of Bob as like Robert. cut off rope. Robert. <laughs> Sorry. Because my last name's not, so Bob. Bob not. not really no, no, no. Sorry. No. <laughs> Robert. I go by anything. Robert. Robert. Bobby. Most of my, most of my friends call me Bobby. Bobby? Yeah. I'll call you Robert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, really love this movie. Looks like you had an awful lot of fun with it. We were talking a little bit in the back, and uh, it's interesting, you know, with these two kind of iconic characters, you really kind of, you know, forged your own course with these guys. Uh, and now it's really interesting, this particular period in time. I was looking, and I, d I don't think you've explicitly stated what year we're in here. Have you? In the book? No, no, I haven't. But one of the things that I have done, and I've done this, you know, with some consideration, is I want the guys to grow and get older and move on and become different people, right. like we all are, as opposed to be, you know, uh, Spencer for 45 years right. or something. <laughs> Sorry, Bob, I'm not, I don't mean that as a sure. like, You know what I'm saying, but I like the fact that they grow with the times and then the times change. And then each year, there, I, added something hopefully like we get in our lives today that is progress in in you know in the town or you know in mechanism or machinery or you know whatever yeah so you know um so yeah no i, I keep it keep it moving but i don't pick a date well it's interesting this this time is is really things are changing so quickly at this point you know it's kind of the end of the the frontier era and you're seeing the modern age starting to creep in. And these uh, these two guys are, you know, old school, a couple of old school lawmen, you know, trying to keep up with all of this. And it's a great dynamic. You see, uh, you know, in the book itself, there are two kind of threads going. There's the main kind of Cole and Hitch plot, and then there's the story within the story, which is really cool. Uh, um, can you talk about kind of the approach you took with these two twin narratives? Well, I can't. I, you know, what happened with Robert Parker's setting the stage with his characters, it, it, everything was from Hitch's point of view. And when we made our movie based on, made our movie Appaloosa, uh, based on Robert Parker's book, we, the, the whole movie was from Hitch's point of view. You never see, um, you never see Virgil or any other you know, storylines outside of, you know, Hitch's point of view. And for the first couple of books, I did that pretty much. And then I found after a while that I wanted to venture out and, and, and bring other elements to these characters and other stories. And as Steve pointed out, he's in, in, enjoying the, 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 the wind up and the pitch of that, which yeah. thank you. I, I think it works well. I'm, I'm it happy about. Worked well in the last book too. Yeah, the the, the Re yeah revelation. Yeah. Uh, both of both of those the last two books, I I just ventured out of. I mean, you know, you could I could stay with Hitch forever, and and and, and tell compelling stories, 
but you're limited. I mean, you're just limited because it's not a third person situation. It's this guy, you know, and whatever that guy's experiencing, whether he goes to the bathroom or whether he, you know, <laughs> kills somebody, it's all over. It's all over his shoulder. Right. And there's a, there's a bit of a Doctor Watson element to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I did. You know, I, I I can honestly say that I I love the idea of of bad guys not necessarily being bad guys. You know, m most westerns are set up where you have a bad guy and you know that guy's going to get it in the end. But with this these books, I kind of not with not with revelation so much but with this one you don't really know who's who's the bad guy right. you know and and I always think there isn't really necessarily antagonists there's only circumstances that make people do what they do so right and then you know this particular book is starting to have a real modern feel to it too because you have these two competing <coughs> kind of groups I suppose the McCormick group and the Baptiste Baptiste yeah and uh, you know there's a, a dispute involving um, mineral rights, essentially. Right, well, yeah. Or gold, gold. Uh, that's found on the land. And um, and then, also, we have uh, Appaloosa. It's coming up to their Appaloosa days. It's the big kind of fiesta that's going to be taking place. And in the background, you see, you know, you talk about how the city is now, it's getting much more refined. There's theater. Yeah, And the there's all sorts of things going there's on. There's a cobbled stone street. Yes. <laughs> There's, there are some spoilers that we can't give away. What can you tell us about um, the story within the story? Well, um, I think one of the things that I'm very proud of with this book is I love exploring women characters, and there's quite a few women characters in this book. I, this doesn't really give anything away. Um, and each one of the women in this book have a point of view. Mm -hmm. They've got something... Um, you know their their actions are integral to the story, and um, they're as strong, if not stronger, than the men in the story. And there's five of them, and not one of them is a whore, and not one of them is a barmaid, and not one of them is uh, a school marm or a you know little house on the prairie. Times they are changing. The times are changing, and they're very outspoken and they're so you were, we're seeing that that movement right. <laughs> and so Hitch and, Hitch and Cole are faced with that a little bit too it's like alright you know what what's going on here you know so I mean I think I can say that that I think is is uh, prominent in the book and again I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that for for being a western and hopefully you lady folks will pick it up and enjoy it uh, um, I know a lot of a lot of people probably shy away from westerns for the, this just the genre in general, but I will say the other thing I'll say is I don't really look at these books as westerns. No. I really don't. I mean, they're not really, are they? No, no they're not. I don't know what they are, <laughs> but good books. No. Thank you. But they're they're just not they're not necessarily westerns. They're they're uh, uh, for one thing I've each one of them has been somewhat of a, a suspense, a mystery sort of element to them, you know, um, and um, which is you don't get in a lot of westerns. Um, so, and, and they're in, and, and also the plots are very um, they're very involved in the plot. Well, it's funny, you know, I, I think of someone like a Lauren Estelman. You know some of Bill Pranzini's work. You know these are put in the Western category, but there's so much more than that. You right. Know, James Carlos Blake, somebody like that, right. who's just taking these historic kind of iconic figures and really showing them uh, as real human beings, you know, not just the, what you see on the old TV shows. No. Things. Right. 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 Let me interject really quick. If if we define uh, a Western as the hero rides into town, finds a wrong, writes the wrong, and rides off again. I think Lee Child's Reacher books are classic, Absolutely. classic westerns. Yeah, exactly. He's been writing westerns that just happen to take place in the 21st century. Yeah, right. Along. Absolutely. A lot of those guys do that. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's a formula that works. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to call it a formula, but it does. It, it sort of works in that way. And 
and again, I, I've done my best to stay away from it and hopefully, you know, create something that is unique and unusual for the Western setting. Um, I think I think we're getting there. Well, it's interesting to think about uh, what was that famous, uh, what was that Clint Eastwood kind of game-changing movie? Uh, Unforgiven. Unforgiven, yeah. you know, they kind of turned that whole genre on its end. And, uh, you know, writers like yourself and you, also, this is a through line. You know, are exploring what does justice really mean? Is justice possible? Um, which is a good segue into uh, asking you a little bit about your new book, which has a really cool and interesting premise. Um, you have these two characters, Michael uh, fin fin Finnegan, Finnegan you know, ex New York cop. You know, I think they call him Mr. Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. Very classic kind of investigator, interested in playing by the rules to a certain extent, at the beginning of the book anyway. Uh, and then you have this other character, Piero, uh, part Spanish, and uh, we were talking before, I thought really important is she's part Algerian too, and uh, has a completely different uh, kind of methodology, and part spy. And so they get together and form, what are you talking about? Give us the setup. Well, the setup, what I got in by doing research for my uh, journalism work, because I'm a newspaper editor, I was in here studying about the International Criminal Court, and one of the things I learned about it is that it's got judges and lawyers and clerks and researchers, but it doesn't have cops. There are no cops to the International Criminal Court. So when the court wants to go get one of the worst of the worst people in the world, they send out invitations to like Slobodan Milosevic and say, would you kindly come so we can prosecute you? We shall have it catered. You know? And that's why it took 20 years to get those guys. Milosevic died before they could get the, that trial done. So I thought, oh, okay, so what if there's somebody whose job it is to go and get the worst of the worst and hand them on a silver platter to the International Criminal Court, which would be intrinsically a criminal job. It would be transporting people across international lines against their will. So that was the beginning of it. Then the second thing I wanted to accomplish was Finnegan and Fierro, two protagonists that are absolute co-equals with differing skill sets. They're a man and a woman who are not lovers. They are pals, their buddies, and respect each other, because I just hadn't seen that in a thriller mystery novel, and I really wanted to explore how much fun that would be. Yet. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> can you, can you yeah. explain the title? Absolutely, yes, I absolutely cannot explain the title. It's St. <laughs> Nicholas Salvage and Wrecking, and four different characters at one point or another ask our protagonist where it comes from, and they don't tell them. And towards the end of the book, the woman who is the senior court judge at the International Criminal Court let, tells them that she's figured it out and why St. Nicholas and the, the historic character St. Nicholas is a is a pretty good uh, totem for them. So we better read the book. Well, I'm not telling you how to live your life, you know, it's, it's the West, you do what you want to do. So um, it, they meet, you can, can you tell them how they meet in the Ukraine where they each kind of actually hurt each other. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a concept in, in, in a lot of fiction called a meat, meat cute, and these characters have a, a meat crappy, uh, <laughs> where they actually wound each other, uh, they shoot and stab each other, and it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, Finnegan is very much the Boy Scout, he, you know, you gotta do things by the book, you have to do it by the book, and he's escaped New York because his father was a famous New York policeman who was crooked and was uh, did time for corruption. And Fierro grew up in a very liberal household in Spain, uh, left-leaning left parents. And after the bombings uh, in Madrid, the, the train bombings, she went and joined the military and became an assassin. So they're both fleeing from the families. And, and she believes that there are no rules. You should just do what you got to do. If, you need, you know, if the only tool in your toolkit is a silencer, then every job looks like an assassination. That's kind of where she comes from. So as they work together, they both figure out that neither of them have it right and that both of them have to bend. And that's the, the course of, of their characters. Right. In, the, in this first uh, kind of outing, um, they are kind of brought in to track down, uh, see what's behind these, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, child sex trafficking that's going on with these Middle Eastern refugee kids, and which is pretty heart of darkness stuff. Did you do some research into that? Yeah, and, and it was really depressing. Uh, there's a lot of people who prey on the most vulnerable people in our world. That's nothing new. It's, uh, that's always been around. And um, I actually wanted to do something. I wanted my bad guys in this book to be just bad guys. I have decided, now nah, why don't we just go ahead and have bad guys? And they don't have a lot of shades of gray, because I thought it would be... I had written shades of gray characters in my other seven novels. I thought it would be fun to do 
some characters who just you really want them to catch a bullet like chapter two. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty bad. And yeah, I did a lot of research and a lot of it was really depressing. Now, the the uh, trafficking is a major problem here. Um, and also, it's intriguing that uh, this organization that they kind of form um, is sort of based in Cyprus. And uh, there's an interesting reason behind that. Can you talk about it? I, I got to travel to Cyprus and the former Yugoslavia and to France to do the research for this book. And Cyprus was fascinating for a number of reasons. And because we're most Americans, Americans aren't really good with geography. Cyprus has Turkey at 12 o'clock and um, Israel and Syria at 3 o'clock and Egypt at 6 o'clock. So it's at that eastern part of the Mediterranean. And it's got phenomenally corrupt banking because that's where a lot of the Russian oligarchs have been hiding their money. So if you had a corporation that was there, it could, you could obscure it pretty easily because they're, they're, it's so darn corrupt. Secondly, it's, it's the Greek Cypriots control two-thirds of the island, and the Turk Cypriots control one-third after a civil war in 1974, and it's got a split capital like Berlin used to be, where you hand your passport to a guy under a Greek flag, and you walk 40 paces, and you hand your passport to a guy under a Turkish flag, and you get across. And I just thought, yeah, you know, if you're going to set up the, you know, a bunch of angry and cranky people, what a great place to do it. Secondly, while you're doing the research, you can't have a bad cup of coffee or a bad meal because you got Greeks and Turks. So, I mean, it was not hard work. And there are a lot, lot of expat uh, English there. There's still two air bases, military, uh, British military air bases there. And so it just was, it was a really an ideal situation, as was the former Yugoslavia. They're just a lot of fun places to write and do research. So let me ask you a question. The, 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 the two characters, they're based on on operatives that work in our country that do exactly what you're talking about, or is these, did, this is something you completely made up? It's something I completely made up. Oh, okay. the, the notion that there's, that there's these, this couple who covertly and secretly work for one of the senior judges of the International Criminal Court handing over bad guys. Do they have guns? Oh, yes, they have guns. And he's not terribly good with it, but she's darn good at it. <laughs> I was, yeah, I wanted to ask too because you know you hear a lot about these sort of private security companies and these mercenary groups and you know all over the world really. Um, this kind of organization, are there lots of little groups out there that are sort of kind of off the grid but still on the payroll in a way? I did some research at the United Nations. Uh, by the way, you can always go to the UN in, in New York and take a tour, which is really fascinating. I would highly recommend it. But I talked to uh, several groups who were involved with the International Criminal Court and. and there, there really is a dearth of anybody who serves or functions in the form of a police department for international crime uh, at the highest levels. That just doesn't exist. As you know, the United States has disavowed the International Criminal Court for years and years and years. Otherwise, a gentleman named Bush probably would have gone there at one point, but not as a guest. Um, so it's a, it's a shady and well-organized and well-known, but somewhere it's disrespected organization in The, the Hague not that well understood by a lot of people. There's just a lot of material there. That's, I was going to say, are you interested in it to continue with the stories of, of International Court and these two characters? Or is this an ongoing series? I, I've written a sequel. My publisher has yet to purchase the sequel. But your lips to God's ear, that will happen. <laughs> with, the, with the same two characters? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Most excellent. Absolutely. Well, I guess we some of you probably haven't heard. Uh, can we get into a little bit of just sort of how you came to, to get this great gig, and uh, you know maybe some of your, your work in TV and film. You've done a lot of great stuff. Well, I, I thank you. Um, I, um, I made a movie uh, many years back, about 10 years ago now, called Appaloosa. I wrote the movie uh, and produced the movie with my good friend Ed Harris, actor, director. And Ed was reading, he, he actually was over in Ireland on a, a horse trek, and he was reading the book of Appaloosa by Robert Parker, which is his first Western. And Robert Parker, of course, wrote Spencer, Jesse Stone, Sonny Randall, 80 some odd books. And when I was, when Ed called me, he said, I read this book, Appaloosa. Let's really look at this, I think we can make a great movie out of this. We had just written a movie, uh, or I wrote the movie about Machine Gun Kelly, that Ed was going to play Machine Gun Kelly, and it just, 
you know, went to hell in a handbasket <laughs> like everything else does. And I was pretty down about that. We were very close. We were this close to, we had all, everything was set. And, um, you know, Ed very kindly said, hey, look at, let's look at this book. I think we can do this. So I adapted the book right off, uh, you know, and I thought it, the two characters were great. And we wrote it and Ed came back from the trip and we started, you know, cutting it down to a screenplay. And within six months we were set up and in, in, in production. Um, it, we, it was happened that quick. And we had Jeremy Irons and Vigo Mortison and, and uh, Renee Zellweger, a great cast. And at any rate, Robert Parker loved this movie, loved, loved, loved the movie. And he unfortunately passed away in 2010 and sitting at his typewriter and Ed and I went to a memorial for him about six months later. And they were wondering, the Putnam Publishing was wondering what they, if they could make, continue with the, the, the estate. And, uh, and they asked me if I would be interested in writing the novels. And because I knew the characters and wrote the screenplay. And I said, well, hell, I've never written a novel before, but I'll try. They said, okay, good, write 30 pages. So I wrote 30 pages. They said, that's pretty good, write 30 more pages. <laughs> and they, they said, that's pretty good. And they said, they write 30 more pages, and I'm not ser I'm serious. They kept going, like, give us another 30 pages. And I said, they tricked you into it. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Anyway, it was like, well, the point being is, is uh, Chris, the, the, the editor at the time, she said, I really want to know what's going to happen. So I got the gig. Now, is there a, um, I think I've asked uh, Ace this before, is there like a Bible that you have to go by? No. These characters? No. Because no. he wrote how many, I think you've written more now than Parker actually wrote, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've written, this is my sixth. Sixth. And I'm working on the seventh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so you don't, you can kind of, uh, you know, go by what he wrote and really take it in your well, own you direction. Well, you know, uh, for, for those of you who have not read Parker, and I, I hope you do, um, really fabulous work because it's these really short chapters um, there are a lot of dialogue um, snappy stuff it moves pretty very quickly and I, by the way when I first got the gig I thought oh man I can do that it's like a children's <laughs> book I can write you know three or four page chapters no problem and then when I got around to doing that I went oh man this is pretty hard you know because it's like you got to have a beginning middle and an end and you got to make you want a page turn turner you got to be <laughs> something that's going to propel them for the next chapter and Robert B. Parker was the tightest writer yeah his, there's just not a line uh, loose in his, in his writing yeah so you know um, I it, it was it was a challenge yeah. and uh, but then you know I had to at some point realize that I'm not Robert Parker <laughs> did Joan get a chance to read oh by the things? way you know speaking of Joan I'm glad you bring Joan up did you guys you meet John? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you? I think she came with him once, didn't she? She had. Boy, I gotta tell you, Joan Parker. I don't remember. She, she was, uh, you know, she was like one of the coolest women I've ever met in my life. Yeah, Ace talks about her a lot. She yeah. was like, I, I, I can't tell you what an amazing character she was, and I think she had probably a whole lot more to do with Robert Parker than Robert Parker did. <laughs> because she was very outspoken, very sharp and, and acerbic and interesting and didn't, you know, didn't pull any punches. You know, she's just a really fascinating woman. Now that you mention it, you know, the, the female characters are, could be seen as kind of an homage to Joan, you know? Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, mine do. Yeah, for sure. exactly. Because I grew up with women like that. I had a lot of crazy women in my family, you know. <laughs> I did. I, you know, my I came from a family of uh, traveling tent show people. Really? Yeah, and my, my, my grandparents had a traveling tent show that followed the wheat harvest. And my Aunt Marjorie and my mom and and my Uncle Johnny and all these guys, they, they were gypsies and they, they were nuts. And they put on three act melodramas. That's how they 
how they lived and made a living. They wrote their own plays, and and my grand grandfather, they were just crazy. My aunt Marjorie was the leading lady. She was really beautiful, little bitty thing, and she like you know wore cowboy boots and smoked Marlboros. Was gay as can be, hated men, you know. I remember when I was like 10 years old, she turned around to me one time, I was sitting in the back seat, and she goes, you're going to die. You're going to die like everybody else. You're going to die. You're not going to live forever. You know? I mean, she's just like, so anyway, I was, so yeah, so she had a little Joan Parker in her. Joan, Joan, Joan told me one time, she actually told me this, she goes, there I was, married to Robert Parker. Daniel and David, please, this is this is uh, a, a big plus. But she said, I had this baby, and she said, what in the hell am I going to do with this baby? You know? And she was just so genuine, you know, talking about it. She was just very frank. And, you, you know, most most women, you know, they it's a different, there's a different mother-son or mother-daughter. But she was just very frank about, okay, here I go. You know, and, and, and very open to talk about it. You know, so I, she was a fascinating woman. It was interesting well, because, you know, Parker loved Arizona, obviously. Loved, you know, he'd come out here all the time, really. And um, I got to meet him maybe three or four times, I think. And uh, the only reason I bring it up is that he had, um, remember when he had that open heart surgery? Yeah. And um, he had a reputation, sorry guys, but uh, of being kind of a crusty, uh, you know, not, didn't have, seemed to have a whole lot of time to meet with fans or whatever. Um, and then after that incident, where I think, what did they do? They nicked his aorta, I think, and he almost died on the yeah. operating table. Yeah. He came back the next time after that, and he was, I thought, very changed. You know, he right. was unbelievably warm and, you know, gracious with everybody. And seemed, I think it had, you know, seemed to have a real appreciation for his fans life in general and definitely right. a change yeah uh, yeah well he was uh, he was a, a, a very unique uh, storyteller and a wonderful wonderful human being yeah he and Barbara were really really close Barbara yeah. Peters the right. owner and they they stayed in touch and emailed back and forth did you get to meet him Robert oh yeah you did yeah yeah no he came to the premiere of Appaloosa oh and everything. oh I know that's one of Ace's regrets. He never got to meet him. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I think they had a like, Ace sent him a fan letter, I believe, and yeah. he got a really nice response. But uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Reed, who does the Jesse Stones, ever met him. I don't think he ever either. met him either. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Reed is no longer doing that. I didn't know that. Yeah, Reed moved on. Somebody else is doing that now. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Reed did his last one, so it's. But they're still they're anyway the Parker legacy is continues. Right. Well, Dana, tell us a little bit. I know that are you still uh, working at, for the Portland which paper was it? Portland Tribune. Portland. I'm the managing editor or barely managing to be editor depending on the week that you ask. <laughs> and uh, we're a coalition of about 25 small weekly and monthly newspapers all over the Portland area. And we all we, we form if, if you will a very small wire service. So we feed each other's papers. And, is this Oregon? Oregon, yes. This is Portland, Oregon, and the suburbs around it. And uh, all hyper-local journalism. We cover the Little League and the Rotary Club and the softball because no one else does. And, how, about the, yeah. how about the crime beat? Um, we, I have two excellent, excellent reporters who, who cover cops and courts, one of whom has uh, solved two murders and gotten one guy out of prison because he didn't do it. Uh, Jim Redden, one of the classic journalists in Oregon. So what is your day like? Oh, I've always, by the way, I always have admired people that do what you do. I don't know how you do that. So I don't have any idea how it's done either. Uh, so what, what do you do? Um, I am very fortunate to have mostly senior reporters who've been around a long time, so I suggest very few stories to them. 80% of the stories, they tell me what they're writing. And then I have a couple of younger reporters, and I say, here's something you ought to think about doing. This would be a good idea. And, and uh, then as the stories come in, I edit them and make sure that they look good. I get to work with tremendous, tremendous photojournalists. I have two that are 
outstanding, and then I get to work with really great paid designers. So once we have the story, and we know the story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it does a nice through line and a nice narrative, then I can work with my photography, I can work with my page design, and I can make it look really gorgeous. So a lot of my job is air traffic control. Wow. But you work really fast? I am really, really fast. I'm a very fast writer. Um, everybody I know in the fiction world who comes out of journalism is because we don't have writer's block, we have unemployment. Uh, and uh, if you ever came back from a school board meeting and said the muse wasn't with you, they would really laugh hard right up to the fire. Yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about, um, you published, this is your 10th? This is book number eight. I had number three eight. with Bantam, Crash and then I is. had what we sometimes refer to as my dry spell, which lasted for 15 years in which I couldn't sell anything. I could have walked into a bank with a sign that said I have a gun and no one would have read it. Um, it, was, it was a pretty dry spell. And then uh, four books with St. Martin's, and they were the first three were straight-up mysteries, and these were thriller mysteries. Crashers was the first of those. And I have to say, um, I had a tremendous, tremendous editor at Bantam, and I had a tremendous editor at St. Martin's who made me better. And not every writer talks about having good editors. I had, you know, Keith Kayla at St. Martin's Minotaur, just, you know, a masterful editor, and I'm sure having fun. Well, let me ask you, because you're an editor, and you're good at it, quick, how did you take to somebody else editing your work? Were you completely open, or at first, or not? Yes, very much so, because I'm used to, if you come back from a school board meeting, if you come back from any kind of meeting, and you have 28 pages worth of notes, and they say, you know what, we only have six inches left in the newspaper, one column, but well, six inches deep. You say, that's fine, I could write Jesus' obit in six inches. I can, I can write anything in any space you give me. Or I can write it in 48 inches. I can write whatever you need me to do, because that's it's very much not an art, it's very much a working class craft. So um, when I started working in fiction, one of the, at St. Martin's, the weird thing that happened, they said, this book will be due in March. And I said, okay, and I handed it in in December, a bit early. And they said, well, we've never had anybody hand a book in early, because when we said March, what we actually meant was September, because we assumed you'd blow the deadline. So, they just didn't know what to do with a guy who never 